Good morning. morning. Welcome to all of you guests and visitors who are with us to witness the confirmation of your nieces, uh, grandsons, granddaughters. I'm not sure what the connection is, but we're glad you're here uh, to be with us and to see this wonderful, momentous thing, a confirmation of the biblical faith that they were already given in their baptisms. Uh, What an exciting day. Uh, While we begin our day, why don't we begin it together, the word of prayer, asking the Lord's blessing. The only Father, we are so thankful for this great gift, the gift of your grace and your mercy, your forgiveness, uh, your love. We are so thankful for this thing that you have shown us uh, in so many ways in your Son, Jesus Christ. You have uh, justified us by what he has done on the cross and by what he has done with his life, his death, and his resurrection. Lord, we are so thankful for this good thing that you have done for us. And today, Lord, you yet again fill us with good things, with your Holy Spirit, with your word and sacrament. Lord, we ask that you would indeed fill us up with faith and the Holy Spirit and the sacrament and your word so that we can return to our lives, the neighborhoods that we live in, and share that good news of grace and salvation, of justification by faith, forgiveness in Jesus. Help us this Lord this day and bless our time together. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. We sing our first hymn.
Please stand. We begin at our Lord's invitation. And so in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed be the Lord, the God of heaven, from everlasting to everlasting. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. Walk around Zion, go around her, number her towers, consider well her ramparts, go through her citadels, that you may tell the next generation that this is us, our God forever and ever. He will guide us forever. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and alone and atone for our sins, for your name's sake. We, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. We continue with our rite of confession and absolution. Do you believe that you are a sinner? Yes, yes I believe it. I am a sinner. How do you know this? from the Ten Commandments, which I have not kept. Are you sorry for your sins? Yes, yes I am sorry that I have sinned against God. What have you deserved from God because of your sins? His wrath and displeasure, temporal death and eternal damnation. Do you hope to be saved? Yes, that is my hope. In whom then do you trust? In my dear Lord Jesus Christ. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We continue with the intro. I will speak of your testimonies before kings, O Lord, and shall not be put to shame. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will speak of your testimonies before kings, O Lord, and shall not be put to shame. Thank you. 
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty and gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us steadfast in your grace and truth. Protect and deliver us in times of temptation. Defend us against all enemies and grant to your church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for our reading. Our first reading for this, our Festival of the Reformation, is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 14. St. John records, I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We continue with our psalm, and please note there are separate verses for men and women and all of us together. We begin. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord how he has brought desolations on the earth. He gave his cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our second reading, our epistle lesson, is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, the third chapter. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Of all the documents in the Lutheran Confessions, the small called Articles are the most personal testimony of Martin Luther, the great reformer. 
Fearing for his life, he drafted a set of articles outlining what he felt was most important for his hearers and followers to know of his biblical teaching. Section 2 focuses on the office and work of Jesus Christ, God's Messiah and our Redeemer. Luther writes, the first and chief article is this, Jesus Christ, our God and Lord, died for our sins and was raised again for our justification. He alone is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and God has laid upon him the iniquities of us all. All have sinned and are justified freely without their own works or merits by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, in his blood. This is necessary to believe. This cannot be otherwise acquired or grasped by any work, law, or merit. Therefore, it is clear and certain that this faith alone justifies us. As St. Paul says, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law, that he might be just, and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Please stand. We continue with the verse. Alleluia! Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Alleluia! The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 8th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. You may be seated.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our verse for consideration will be Romans chapter 3, verse 28. We, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. One of our great treasures in Lutheran theology, something that these young confirmation students have been studying for the last three years, is the understanding the, the dual nature of law and gospel, a blessed treasure of Lutheran theology. God's word, when spoken in the Garden of Eden before the fall, God spoke, people did. And it wasn't broken into law and gospel. But sin comes into the world, and now when we hear God's word, we can hear it one of two ways. It will affect our conscience in one of two ways. Like a mirror, it shows us our sin and it crushes us under the weight of it. That is the law. And the gospel, well, the word of God can show us hope, salvation, joy, and most importantly, forgiveness in Jesus Christ that is applied to you because God loves you and wishes you to be with him in eternity. The theology of law and gospel then is maybe a good way for us to encounter our epistle lesson and ring out some truth for us to understand today. In our Romans reading, Paul makes it very clear. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified and justified uh, maybe a very important word. Maybe not all of us quite understand what that means. Maybe we should clarify. Just for the sake of the rest of the sermon. To be justified might be in kind of a forensic sense, a courtroom sense, that the judge declares that you are just. It's declarative. God declares this thing on you. So when the scriptures talked about being justified, we are being made right with God. We are being made righteous. We are being made just by the work of Jesus. We talk a lot about justified. Paul talks about it in his word. Again, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Later he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Mankind is flawed by sin. Adam and Eve brought it into the world. We have all been infected by it since. On top of this, St. Paul says, through the law comes knowledge of sin. So not only does the law uh, wound our conscience and crush us into oblivion, but then the law, the mirror, shows us clearly how badly we failed on top of it. It's like a double whammy. Paul tells us... Uh, He's speaking to the Romans and, and talking about this, this human thing, which is really amazing. 2,000 years ago and still yet today, there is this human problem. We try to self-justify. We look to ourselves to make ourselves right with God. We are curved in on ourselves, always looking for answers here and very rarely looking for answers here. Something I want to bring up that we also talked about in confirmation was an idea of coarse idolatry versus regular idolatry. Remember when we had that conversation? And coarse idolatry is when we worship a pagan god outright. When there's a god of Baal and we sit in front of it and we worship it and we say, that's God. That's coarse idolatry. Regular idolatry, Luther says very clearly, that anything that we put our trust in, our hope in, our hopes of salvation in, that is our God. Money, pride, power, fame, lots of things fall into this regular category of idolatry. I thought perhaps, maybe, we could apply this to this self-justifying thing as well. Um, maybe there is a difference between a coarse idea of self-justifying versus a maybe fine or normal idea of self-justifying. Paul is talking to the people in the epistle, stop trying to justify yourself by doing good things. You think that you can follow the law well enough, do enough good things to balance out the bad things, and thus you can earn your way into heaven. That won't work. 
Now we as Lutherans, and especially confirmants who have been trained in the faith, we know better, right? Oh my goodness, how could anyone think that they could do enough good works to merit for the sins that we have committed against God? Yes, this is true. And yet... There's a funny thing that happens when you engage in the office of private confession and absolution. And I don't mean to put anyone to shame. But what happens is, immediately upon offering, the person who makes a confession, and oftentimes it can be traumatic, it can be difficult. They make that confession, and you offer the words of the blessing, the words of grace. The Lord forgives you, and he loves you. And then almost right after that moment, the person then says, after the tears are over and after the emotional poor part of that thing is over, then they say, you know, Pastor, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get back in church more regular and I'm going to be studying my Bible more regular and I'm going to do my devotion and all this thing is going to work out. So we take the law that's crushing us and we throw it off through the gospel, only to pick it up and put it back on our shoulders again. It doesn't make much sense. So, the TLH hymnal talked about amending our sinful life. It is good that we should not uh, feel free to continue in our sinful behavior. That is an honest confession. Um, however, uh, sometimes upon receiving forgiveness, people will then tell you about their plans um, they kind of look maybe what I'm saying is a fine sense of self-justifying is I look to Jesus to forgive my sins and square the account bring me back to zero and from here on out I will do a better job with my devotion, prayers, schedule, church attendance and so on perhaps in our mind our thoughts and our actions betray what we really think, somewhere we don't want to admit. If there is anything worthwhile doing, I need to do it myself. How many times have we said that? Maybe it's something else. It's got to be done. You've got to do it yourself. What will I trust in? Will I trust in being humble? You see, if I am humble and self-deprecating, then I show forth a repentant heart. I'm exactly what Lutheran should be. I trust in my ability to be humble. In fact, if Christ has made me a saint through baptism, which, by the way, that's what we believe, then I must be one. And here's the rub. Even I, see, I'm almost preaching to myself here, okay? Can you call yourself a saint and mean it? And if you can't, well, then we've drastically underestimated what Jesus has done. And it speaks to that, this maybe this fake sense of feeling like to be a proper Christian, to be a proper Lutheran, I must be humble and sacrosanct all the time. I must be down all the time. If you can't believe that you're a saint, well, then you're missing the point. Will, instead of maybe my humility, I'll trust in my faith. How strong is it today? Or maybe, perhaps, we'll trust in the fact that my faith is more biblically correct than so-and-so's faith out there. You see. I have a certain percentage of faith. I have a mustard seed of faith. What do I trust in? I trust that I have faith. How many children's TV shows or children's movies, Disney movies are terrible about this, right? Where they say, all you got to do is believe. Believe in what? I don't know, but believe. Have faith in what? I don't know, but have faith. Okay, what does that mean? Faith is not an end to itself. Our faith is in something or someone. Perhaps it's not that. What if I trust in my feelings? Ooh, we love to talk about feelings. Worship didn't give me that high I was looking for. It didn't lift me up. It didn't make me walk out feeling really good about myself. You know, truthfully, if a pastor is doing his job, he should make you uh, feel pretty crummy about yourself and want to receive the forgiveness of Jesus. 
I feel a great swell of emotion. God is here. He is working in me. But feelings are fickle things. They ebb and they flow for all sorts of reasons. And I have to admit, there are days where even I come in and I am not feeling it. But we put our hope, our trust in something stronger than feelings. You see, feelings are changing and moving all the time. God instead gives us his word. And then in his word, he says, for I do not change. These promises are objectively true. They will always be true because I am God and I do not change. Thanks be to God we have something in our life that is set because truth be told, we're always in the process of changing. Some of us uh, getting wider, getting older, maybe losing hair. Yeah. And we're also changing in terms of how we hear the scriptures changes. When we have kids, suddenly hearing the scriptures in various verses, certain things, they hit us in a whole new way that we never heard before because our perspectives have changed. Now why, if we're in this constant state of change all the time, if, if our emotions are to and fro, can go up and down on a moment's notice, why would we put our faith in them? If I'm feeling good, well then God is there. If I'm feeling good, well then uh, I'm in a place that believes. I believe. No. I shouldn't trust in my feelings. They're fickle. I read an interesting metaphor uh, uh, from another pastor, and I, I, I hate to say this, but I read it, and then I kind of lost the, the resource. I, I can't remember the pastor's name. So we'll credit him, and somewhere in God's creation, he'll know that he's being credited. I, don't, I can't remember his name. I, I apologize. But he told a metaphor or told a story about a, a dog, uh, and I have been forced into <coughs> dog ownership against my will. Um, and uh, what dogs do is uh, they'll go out into the yard, and they'll throw up, and then they'll go do something, and then they'll come back to the throw up, and what will they do? They'll eat it. <laughs> so, why would we receive the gospel through grace, not through the law? Throw off those chains of sin, and then immediately put the law back on our shoulders. It makes no sense. Listen to what Paul says. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. What has Christ done for us? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forth as a propitiation. And propitiation is a really big word for a, an atoning sacrifice. A sacrifice that, that makes clean the person who is guilty, right? A propitiation. God put forth Jesus as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. It was a gift for us. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Paul is telling us that we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but that God in his rich mercy has sent his son to be an offering in our place. God is just. He does all things perfect. So maybe sometimes we might want to, why does God continue to punish? If he loves us, why doesn't he just gloss over it? Why doesn't he just forget it? Why doesn't he just kind of sweep it under the rug? He's God. He can do whatever he wants. Well, the problem is, if he's a God who does that, he's not a God who's just. If he's a God who's just, he's a God who's just all the time. And if he's just all the time, then he must punish sin. And so our God is just that he stays just for us. <laughs> but he also has compassion. Then he, he takes that punishment and he puts it on his son instead of us. He's just and he shows compassion. He remains just and he justifies us. What a beautiful, beautiful thing that God does for us. Our hope, our trust, our faith can't be in us. Our plans, our will, our power, our possessions, our confirmation knowledge. 
We have faith in Jesus. We trust in Jesus, whose birth, preaching, teaching, miracles, death, and resurrection was for us to forgive our sins. All this we find in Scripture alone. Faith in all this, I believe, is simply to trust that Jesus did all of this for us because of his great love for us. After all this, to turn around and immediately look for more law to put on our backs and justify ourselves, it's folly. Paul says, by what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. It's clear that at times our actions betray us. We put faith in things other than Jesus, things that are usually ourselves. However, the word today, our epistle lesson today, not only contains the law, but we should plumb its depths for the rich gospel that it has. For some reason beyond my understanding, God loves us despite our sin. He sent his son to be a propitiation, an atoning sacrifice to pay for our sins. Now, Jesus talks about freedom in our gospel lesson. And I believe that freedom is to know that God has written our names in the book of life. That he has washed us clean from our sins. And not only that, but that he gave us the Holy Spirit to create aid, and strengthen our faith. All this we can continue to believe even through the difficulties that are out there in the world. And what is this faith? We trust that Christ's death and resurrection was for us, was for each and every one of us to wipe away our sin and stains, make us clean forever and forgiven. We trust we believe, we, as Paul says, have faith that this forgiveness from Christ through baptism and the word makes us saints and worthy of eternity and salvation. Perhaps I have struggled my whole life to understand what this means. Paul says, live in the gospel. He says, live free, have freedom, know the grace and gospel of the Lord. And I keep saying to myself, what does that mean? I don't know what it's like to live. All I know is how to live under the law and to punish myself. That's all I know. Perhaps it means that living free, living in this freedom, is knowing every day, day to day, that no matter what happens today, I don't need to earn anymore. I don't need to do any more good works to cancel out the bads. I don't need to be afraid anymore. Instead, my trust is in the forgiveness of sins given in Jesus Christ. When we rid ourselves of our idols, those things we put trust in instead of Jesus, when we trust in Christ every day for our salvation, and we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's coming, that's freedom. Take they our life. Good fames and wife. That's freedom. Not being afraid anymore. And that's joy. And it's hope. We serve our neighbors in love out of thankfulness and responsibility, but we are declared righteous and clean by our Father, who on account of the suffering of his Son has redeemed your debts. We live in freedom. A freedom not to do whatever we wish, but a freedom to be what God has made us to be, to find ourselves in the groove, to go with the flow, God's flow, his groove, to be who he wishes us to be. How do God's children live and love the world like Jesus? How are God's children redeemed and forgiven? Well, they are forgiven by Jesus. On this Reformation Sunday, we remember one incredibly important, simple truth. I know you're probably like wanting to tear your hair out at this point. Aren't you just going in circles? Yeah, I'm going in circles. This message is something that we're used to, but it's not something that's out there in the world. And 
the hope of forgiveness and salvation and joy is not something that people are going to randomly tell you just because. It's something that happens a lot here, but it's very easy to take for granted. You're going to go out beyond these church walls someday, live a life out there in the world. I would say the one thing you have to take with you is remembering this truth. It's so good. Don't let people convince you there's all sorts of things that you must do, but rather trust in Jesus. Listen to Paul. For we, that includes you now, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Dear friends in Christ, cling to that simple teaching of the gospel. And you will know freedom like you've never known before. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. I invite you to... Uh, that are going to be confirmed. I'd like to maybe just give a, a two quick sentences about what confirmation is for maybe folks who are visiting. All of these children, I children's probably not the right word, youths, youths, all these youths, um, were baptized into the Christian faith already. They were given faith by the Holy Spirit in the waters of holy baptism. Now, we call this service today confirmation because now they, with their own mouths and their own words confirm that faith which they've already been given through the waters of holy baptism. That's what we're going to do today. And in one, one case for one of our confirmants, it'll also be her first time coming to the holy sacrament. So we're very excited about that. So, come forward. <clears throat> If you'd like to follow along in your hymnals that are in front of you, it's page 272. Beloved in the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ said to his apostles, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You have been baptized and catechized in the Christian faith according to the Lord's bidding. Jesus says, Whoever confesses me before man, I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Lift up your hearts, therefore, to the God of all grace and joyfully give answer to what I now ask you in the name of the Lord. Do you this day in the presence of God and of this congregation, acknowledge the gifts that God gave you in your baptism. Do you renounce the devil? Do you renounce all his works? Do you renounce all his ways? Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord? <coughs> Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Do you hold all the prophetic and apostolic scriptures to be the inspired word of God? Do you confess the doctrine of the evangelical Lutheran church drawn from the scriptures as you have learned to know it from the small catechism to be faithful and true? Do you intend to hear the word of God and receive the Lord's Supper faithfully? 
Do you intend to live according to the word of God and in faith, word and deed, to remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even to death? Do you intend to continue steadfast in this confession and church and to suffer all, even death, rather than fall away from it? We rejoice with thankful hearts that you have been baptized and have received the teaching of the Lord. You have confessed the faith and been absolved of your sins. As you continue to hear the Lord's word and receive his blessed sacrament, he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> we have a special situation here today. I'm actually very happy about it. Uh, Rachel's godfather is also an ordained LCMS minister in Nebraska. Minnesota. Minnesota. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, uh, he is going to do her rite of confirmation and blessing with her Bible verse. Rachel May Eden, the Almighty God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the new birth of water and of the Spirit, and has forgiven you all your sins, strengthen you with his grace and a life everlasting. Amen. And Rachel, your confirmation verse comes from Paul's letter to the Colossians, the second chapter, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught abounding in thanksgiving. <clears throat> Holly, May, Enon, the Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the new birth of water and of the Spirit, and has forgiven you all your sins, Strengthen with his grace to life everlasting. Amen. And your verse is taken from Ephesians chapter 3. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Cole Robert Johnson, the Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the new birth of water and of the Spirit, and has forgiven you all your sins, strengthen you with his grace to life everlasting. Amen. Your verse is from 1 John 2. Let what you have heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. Caden Kenneth Shop. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Isaiah 43, 1. I forgot the first part, didn't I? <laughs> Caden Kenneth Schaff, the Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the new birth of water and of the Spirit, and has forgiven you all your sins, strengthen you with his grace to life everlasting. Amen. And, uh, and his, his uh, father picked that. Is that right? Grandfather picked that verse. Yeah, I'm sorry, I meant grandfather. Picked that verse for him. So. <clears throat> Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your great goodness in bringing these, your sons and daughters, to the knowledge of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and enabling them both with the heart to believe and with the mouth to confess his saving name. Grant that, bringing forth the fruits of faith, they may continue steadfast and victorious to the day when all who have fought the good fight of faith shall receive the crown of righteousness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. 
Amen. Amen. Almighty and most merciful Father, in the waters of holy baptism, you have united your children in the suffering and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, cleansing them by his blood. Renew in them the gift of your Holy Spirit, that they may live in daily contrition and repentance with a faith that ever clings to their Savior. Deliver them from the power of Satan and preserve them from false and dangerous doctrines that they may remain faithful in hearing Christ's word and receiving his body and blood. By the Lord's Supper, strengthen them to believe that no one can make satisfaction for sin but Christ alone. Enable them to find joy and comfort only in him, learning from this sacrament to love you and their neighbor and to bear their cross with patience and joy until the day of the resurrection of their bodies to life immortal. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Uh, could I just have one special thing? Uh, being that we already highlighted one of them, could I have all the sponsors of these kids stand up real quick? The sponsors? Thank you for your continued service to these young people. And you guys remember to thank them for praying for you and uh, continuing to encourage you in the Christian faith. Can I have the parents stand up as well? We thank you for the gift of your children. These last few years has been an utmost blessing. And I will be sad to see them go. Lord's blessings be upon you all. You may return to your seats. You may be seated. I think for the sake of time, since we already did the creed, maybe we'll skip that and go to the next thing. Is that okay? All right. <coughs> As Luther was writing the small called articles in the year 1537, which had now been understood by some as his last will and testament, he addressed the topic of how man is justified before God and his good works in this way. I do not know how to change in the least what I have previously and constantly thought about justification. Namely, that through faith, as St. Peter says, we have a new and clean heart, and God will and does account us entirely righteous and holy for the sake of Christ, our mediator. Although sin in the flesh has not yet been completely removed or become dead, yet he will not punish or remember it. Such faith, renew oh, sorry. Such faith, renewal, and forgiveness of sins are followed by good works. What is still sinful or imperfect in them will not be counted as sin or defect for Christ's sake. The entire individual, both his person and his works, is declared to be righteous and holy from pure grace and mercy, shed upon us and spread over us in Christ. Therefore, we cannot boast of many merits and works if they are viewed apart from grace and mercy. As it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Namely, that he has a gracious God, for with that all is well. We say besides, that if good works do not follow, the faith is false and not true. Please stand as we continue with prayer. <clears throat> Let us pray to our dear Father in heaven as his dear children, asking him to hear us for the sake of Christ and to grant us all things needful and all things beneficial for our salvation. Gracious God, you have renewed your church in every age and generation with the voices of those who recall your people to the gospel and who speak your word in times both easy and difficult. Receive our thanks for blessed Martin Luther and those with him who contended for the gospel against many and great enemies. Make us so bold that we may, in our own age and our own time, contend for the faith against those who would silence our voices or distract your people from the one true and eternal gospel of Christ, crucified and risen. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Holy Lord, you continue to bless your church with faithful pastors and church workers who are determined to know only Jesus Christ. Bless those who serve your people with the means of grace, that they may be preserved in, in temptation and sustained in trial. Open the hearts of many to hear your call to full-time service in the various places where you will 
and according to the gifts and abilities you provide. Give to the people in their care wisdom to hear the voice of your word and to mark false gospels and false preachers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, your word is truth. Keep us from abandoning pure doctrine and preserve us from pride lest we fail to use your truth to call a new generation to know you and love you. Be with all the baptized that we may live out fully the new life you have granted to us by water and the word and guide us to serve our neighbors in love, especially those in need. Help us, especially here at our Redeemer, to be a people willing to share that true gospel and invite friends into worship with us. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Mighty God, you have great power, yet you act with mercy. Teach those who lead us in this land to use power rightly and to act mercifully in the preservation of order, the accomplishment of justice, the protection of life, and the defense of the weak. Give us wise, godly, and faithful leaders who will follow your commands and serve with integrity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, you have continually been the defender of the weak, the advocate for the poor, and the help of the sick and those in need. Deliver the sick in accordance with your will. Relieve their suffering and grant them patience and peace. We pray especially for our own members, Janet, Oliver, Larry, Betty, Florence, Jeannie, Dorothy, Marilyn, Bonnie, Marty, Mary, Lonnie, Marge, Henry, Lois, Dolores, Norma, Esther, and Michael. We pray for those who are near and dear to us as well, Dave, Madeline, Byron, Robin, Belinda, Ann, Vanita, Colby, Ashlyn, Marvin, Kathy, Larry, Joanne, Robert, Sonia, Rob, Shirley, Marie, and Sylvia. We pray for any and all who are up who are plagued by afflictions of the spirit or disorders of the mind that would hinder their appreciation of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Give to the aged your comfort and peace. Give to the grieving hope and the consolation of the gospel and the resurrection of the dead. Especially, we pray today for friends and family of Bud Hardy's brother of Mavis Fritz and Uncle Margit Woshi, recently called to his home in heaven. Give to the dying your presence and bring them into the place of everlasting light and life until the day when we shall be joined with them in heaven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Mighty Lord, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Help us to know it well and keep us from departing from Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. We pray you on behalf of those who have fallen away from the truth, those whose zeal for your house has grown cold, and those who are tempted by doubt and fear. Bring them again into your presence and restore their faith and their place within the fellowship of your church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Lord, you have given us your word as your promise and washed us in baptism to be your own people and to live under you in your kingdom, now and forever. Today especially, we give thanks to you for the gift of faith given to Rachel, Holly, Cole, and Katie. And build us all up in Christ that we may hold the faith in the unity of the Spirit and in the bond of peace and give evidence of this faith in holiness of life. Reprove us when we are in error and reform what is lacking in us, that we may grow up into Christ our head. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty Father, you know best the needs of your church, your people, and your world. Help us not to squander your gifts, but to apply our hearts diligently to the wisdom of your word and the work of your kingdom. Bless the foreign mission fields of our church and give to newly formed churches and congregations 
grace sufficient to grow and prosper according to your gracious will. Receive our tithes and offerings as part of our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, that you may be glorified and the work of your kingdom prospered. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <coughs> Blessed Lord, you have granted us the privilege of a place at Christ's table. Give us also your spirit and faith that we may approach his table with repentance, receive his body and blood with faith, and depart to bear his fruit in lives of holiness and service to you and to our neighbors. Bless your church with unity of doctrine and life, that through the forgiveness of sins we may know the gift of a clear conscience before you and live at peace with one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. Preserve your church, O Lord, and each of us as members of Christ's body. But especially we pray today for those brothers and sisters of the faith who are persecuted in the countries of North Korea, Nigeria, and Kenya. For all of us, we pray that we may not surrender the true gospel for any reason, but be kept in this faith and fear throughout the days of our earthly pilgrimage until that day when we and all your people shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the reward you've prepared for us and all who have loved his appearing. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray, whom with the Father and the Holy Spirit are one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may see it in the offering will be collected. Please stand. We continue now with our service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, because you abundantly provide for all our wants of body and soul. And now we thank you that you have rescued us lost and helpless sinners through the saving work of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taken upon himself the sins of the world and has, by his rising from the grave, opened to us the very gates of heaven. Therefore, with all the company around the throne of the Lamb in his kingdom, we praise and magnify your glorious name now and forevermore. <coughs>
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you, always. I might uh, take a moment to uh, share one thing. You may be seated. Uh, our students have spent a, a long time studying uh, the doctrine and theology of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, specifically to be catechized and come to the Lord's Sacrament. We have lots of guests and visitors. I don't know where you hail from or what your faith tradition might be. But I ask today that if, if you're not LCMS or if you don't necessarily agree with what all these kids have spent three years learning about, that you might refrain from communion today. We could talk more at a later time and uh, come to a resolution together. Uh, we continue with uh, uh, on this date. <laughs>
take and drink the true blood of Christ, shed for you for the remission of your sins.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you that you have fed us with the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, refreshing us with this precious gift and assuring us thereby that we are truly members of his body, the church. Having been blessed to be at your table, we ask you to help us by your Holy Spirit that we be nurtured in faith toward you and complete the good works you desire us to do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, to whom with you and the same Spirit be all honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we conclude with the final hymn.
if that doesn't get your blood pumping, I don't know what will. Um, I, I don't want to belabor announcements today because I know we've, we've run a bit long today in service because of the confirmation. Uh, congratulations to our confirmands, to Rachel, to Holly, to Cole, to Caden. Uh, uh, Stephanie, will, there will be cake again after service for the confirmands? Um, that's for our family. Okay, okay. So um, we're going to have the confirmands at the door. You may greet them. If you have a card for them, you can give it to them at that time. Uh, and uh, uh, give them a well wishes, uh, I I you know, uh, as they've uh, completed this part of their faith, but they're only just beginning in other parts of their faith. We're excited for them. Um, the only thing else I would point out is that Doreen and the Council on Persecuted Christians have put together a prayer vigil that will be next Saturday. Now, there's quite a few times available, and what they're asking is that you would pray, not necessarily here, although that will be open to you if you'd like. You can come here and pray for a half hour, but we're going to do this where we're praying at home. Home. So if you could spare a half hour of your day at home to pray uh, for persecuted Christians throughout the world, that sign-up sheet is in the back. We'd sure love if you could um, uh, help out with that. Pastor, yes. If they sign up, there's a packet of um, prayers, um, there, prayers. There's a packet of prayers as well by the sign-up sheet yes. that, they can, that you can use to facilitate your prayer uh, a vigil, and I just wanted to little, selfishly wanted to point out the last page of your announcements, the Luther quote. All those pictures on that page are mine. Uh, they are pictures I took when I was in Wittenberg, uh, and and they were. I I felt like I got pretty good at taking pictures for a while there. So you can take a look, and if you look really closely at the bottom picture on the left hand side, you'll see a much uh, 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 a skinnier, <laughs> vibrant young man who probably is wearing a sweater that's really not... Uh, my wife has since told me that that sweater is very ugly. Uh, so uh, I wore it a lot, though, because it was very warm. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm standing below a, a, a statue of Martin Luther, which is in the square of the city of Wittenberg, um, right there. So uh, the picture of Luther there, though, on the right-hand side, that's actually inside the castle church in Wittenberg. That's a statue of Luther that stands inside the castle church. So... Um, if you ever want to see more pictures about Wittenberg, i got plenty more. Uh, usually I just bore my wife with them, so I'm sure she'd love if somebody else wanted to look at them. Um, Lord's blessings to all of you. Uh, congratulations, confirmands. Uh, uh, um, uh, I've been very blessed by having you. I'm going to be sad to see you go, uh, and all of your parents as well. Um, uh, I love you all very much, and there's not a thing you can do about it. Lord's blessings.